I'm an investigative reporter from Bucharest, Romania. I teach uh, follow the money techniques. Um, I teach people, I, sometimes journalists, sometimes activists, sometimes even law enforcement. I teach them um, how cross-border or organized crime operates and how you can track them down. So this is a public service that you're doing. The society can take advantage of your investigative reporting if it's indeed thorough investigative reporting. The corruption and the organized crime in Romania is a good case study. So we chose Bucharest as a hub because we can have a regional perspective from here. Organized crime, it's almost always just about the money. There's no ideology behind it. I mean, even if you look at uh, uh, terrorist groups, if you really analyze the inner doings of terrorist groups, you'll see that in the end there are people that profit from that. They are fast, they move across borders, they don't care about language, religion, about social conflicts or whatever. Imagine an, an organized crime group that operates you know, in the United States and in Iran. Do you see uh, law enforcement in the US cooperating with law, law enforcement in Iran? I, mean, I, I don't think so. But for organized crime, for criminals from Iran and the US, so easy to cooperate. Our reporting covers a brand new area. We're not following the path of the law enforcement because we think that law enforcement is very limited. Uh, so our investigative uh, reporting is groundbreaking reporting. You have to go a little bit deeper and try to understand a little bit the minds of the people that you're reporting on. We're reporting on things that were never out there. We investigated a group of assassins, killers for hire. This actually started with this person called Vitaliy Prokar, who was now arrested in Moscow, who was shot with a Kalashnikov seven times, this innocent person in Bucharest. It turned out the same person was wanted for this other assassination attempt that occurred in, uh, in the spring in London. We started digging around and we found out from our reporters in Moldova that in 1998 he was convicted to life in jail because he killed two women. But despite being convicted for life, he was released from prison. He moved across borders. He went to, to the UK, you know, he came into Romania and all this, he kind of moved easily. It occurred to us that it would be very useful to get these border logs. We could find there the dates when he left the country, the dates when he entered the country, and the vehicle that he used. These cars were registered on uh, two Romanian commercial companies. We got the names of the people involved, and to our surprise, those people were also charged with assassinations. These were ruthless killers that would kill people, burn them, and bury them in the woods. We were able to show for the first time that these guys are all connected. Starting with bits of information, we were able to map their comings and goings, and then uh, by following the money, we were able to, to uh, connect them together. Communicating with organized crime is obviously part, part of the job. It's very important to be able to speak a common language with them. The more information you gather about the environment of these guys, the more it helps you when you actually meet them. And they assume that you know much more than you do. Whenever we need to interview someone, we already know the answers to the questions. When we call someone up for an interview, that person agrees because they want to know what we know about them. You're interviewing persons involved in uh, trafficking networks on or organized crime networks, and they're in a country like Bosnia, for instance. And they talk freely about the rest of the networks. Uh, they talk about uh, the members of the network from Romania, from Russia. They talk freely because um, they're, in, in a way, also local. They, they feel that, okay, they can't be harmed in that environment. It's their environment, you know. They, they belong there, and they're, they're the masters of the environment.
We're always trying to piece the puzzle together via public information. And there's a wealth of public information there. It can start in a village in Azerbaijan, in, in this village called Chovda, where the villagers are very unhappy. And they're unhappy because there is a company that came and started uh, to mine for gold. Now, the company that came there cut one of the water supplies uh, to the village. And this is a problem to the villagers. And they're blaming this on the English. This is how they call the Englishman. Because they know that one of the companies operating there is actually a company from uh, Great Britain. The company is called Globex International LLP. But if you look at the ownership of this company, you'll find out that the company is owned by three other companies from Panama. If we look further, we'll find out that the companies in Panama are owned by the two daughters of the president of the first family of Azerbaijan. By investigating locally, we'll find out that the Chovdar gold field was awarded to this consortium of companies by the president him himself on a, his signature. So he signed this decree awarding these lands to these companies to explore and to exploit uh, the gold there. Now the persons that interest us are Leila Alieva, Arzu Alieva, they are the two daughters of the president, and the third one is Mehriban Alieva, who's the wife of the president. But maybe there are some other businesses. And I just search it. There are no less than two, four, six, ten companies. All these companies have some interest back in Azerbaijan. So this is a case where a president of a country, uh, the country being Azerbaijan in this case, is using uh, his power in order to award his own family uh, with private businesses. The most Im important thing for this cross-border investigative network to function is to have collaboration um, between grassroots organizations. And then you also have people that have the regional vision. There's a need for this intelligence to flow freely across borders. It's about the reporter working with hackers and with activists. You always have access to expertise that is outside of your region, outside of your knowledge. We operate with the same um, kind of quickness as the organized crime do. They are real people. They are real people that take advantage of a situation in this country and in that country. They are very, very smart people that are able to create uh, uh, cross-border networks. In a way, we're uh, replicating their models. We don't have their money, we don't have their tools, but we're, we're trying to, to replicate what they're doing. We're trying to create our cross-border networks. Our currency is information. For them, their currency is real currency, it's money. We started mapping the phenomenon. We saw that there's so much money, you know, left and right, and lots of this money cannot be explained in, in any way. What we found was this platform that we dubbed the proxy platform that was used by various criminal groups. Vietnamese organized crime. Russian and Eastern European organized crime groups, Mexican drug cartels. And these companies were created with this sole purpose to assist these people in laundering their money. We named this project the Proxy Platform because most of the companies are owned by proxies, by people that are not even aware that they are owners of these companies or shareholders of these companies. Tormex is a company that was created in New Zealand and Tormex was used by Mexican drug cartels, by the Sinaloa drug cartel, to launder money. One businessman from Romania contacted us and said, look, this Tormex uh, company, I have a litigation with it. And in the court case, there were all the banking records of this company, Tormex, that was a company from New Zealand, but had a bank account in Latvia, in Riga. And these were a few years' worth of transactions. It was more than 600 million euros that went in and out of this, uh, this account. Like the other companies in the, in the network, it was owned by someone who was not aware that he was the owner of this company. So by tracking down this register of transactions of this company, we were able to get from here to other companies that were also involved in crime. And this is how we were able to expose this proxy platform where hundreds of millions, if not billions, were, were laundered.
we reported on these companies, and the government in New Zealand uh, decided to shut down about 1,600 companies, you know, lots of companies that were part of the network. This is something that we're working on, you know, to create more uh, cooperation. And sometimes it doesn't have to be uh, investigative reporters, it can be activists. Actually, some of the uh, best uh, uh, investigations done lately across borders are not done by investigative reporters, but by activists that believe in what they're doing and that add this evidence layer to their work. We investigated this uh, horse meat scandal, and we had to investigate it. We felt there's, a, there's something else there. We were able to completely shift the story. When it was reported by the European press, this was a story of outrage, because people were eating horse meat instead of beef. But when we investigated this, we investigated the money behind it. We followed the money again. We found out that the trading in meat was done via uh, an offshore company, uh, Drop Trading, based in Cyprus. The company in Cyprus was owned by this other company in the British Virgin Islands called Hermes Guardian Trading. And Hermes Guardian and the company in Cyprus were a part of this bigger group of companies involved in many, many other non-transparent deals, including privatization of steel mills in Ukraine. What we found out was that there is this hidden layer, even in the food industry. So that Europeans, they don't know who's putting the food on the table. In this case, people didn't die because of it. But there might be that at some point there's going to be some food that is not going to be very healthy. And people uh, might get sick uh, because of it. And there will be no one to point fingers at. What goes to the public is the information that's based on solid evidence. We're always trying to confirm the information from as many sources as possible, and we never publish information that is not verified. We're uh, receiving uh, very often, actually, letters from the lawyers of criminals that we're exposing, and those letters are very threatening. We're very happy when we're receiving such letters. We're investigating organized crime and corruption. And those people know that they're on the wrong side of things. When we call them at first, we give them a flavor of what we know. We'd like to talk to you about this company from the British Virgin Islands. And they are suddenly like, how do you know about this company? You know, and we start from there. So they want to know how much we know. And they need to make it clear to the persons that they're interviewing that, look, I'm working for this network and I'll interview you, but the information sits with other people in the network as well. So they realize that harming you will not do, uh, do any good to them, because they won't get rid of the story. Whenever you meet someone who's dangerous, you should always have a surveillance on you. Your colleagues coming with a long lens and take photographs. The person that you're interviewing might try to bribe you. They can just uh, shove an envelope into your pocket and then call the police and might uh, uh, say later that they actually bribed you. You can have a recording device on you that transmits outside. You can leave your phone open, you know. Sometimes we're using GPS trackers with our reporters. We also take into account the fact that we're not able to see all the threats that might come our way. It's impossible. And then there's also the litigation risk. Because we're operating across borders, we can be sued in various uh, jurisdictions. And in this case, the, the best defense is the truth. The moment you base your investigative reporting on clear facts, on documents, you can always show that you did very thorough work, you didn't start with the, the intention to, to, to ruin someone. You just want to do good um, for the public. By working on follow the money issues, we also realized that sometimes our reporting is uh, too heavy. And this is how we came about creating this new tool, which is called the Visual Investigative Scenarios, or VIS. So this tool is going to enable researchers, activists, investigative reporters, whoever wants to follow, uh, follow the money. You're mapping, basically. It's, it, it's a mapping system. From this, they, um, they're going to get inspired to search for the politicians of their country. I mean, we're creating this to, to make the story better, basically, you know, to be able to, to say a lot with just uh, uh, graphics.
So it's all about collaboration in the end. It's not about changing who you are. It's about enriching who you are through collaborating with the other. Without these skills, you won't be able to grasp the whole, the whole picture. I want more exposure of the wrongdoing. I want, you know, not just us, the journalists, we want more people to do it. We want as many people as possible to investigate and to use our tools. I mean, you really have access to information and it's growing day by day. It's only a matter of uh, knowing how to take advantage of this. One of the values of this global um, and cross-border investigative reporting is that it can raise awareness um, about things that happen far away from, from the home country, but that are affected by, by your doings in, in your own country.